comes in the motion. May the witness take the oath. I, Mwengi Motuse, do solemnly swear that the evidence that I shall give before the Senate in respect of the matters before the Senate shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Your three hours starts running from now. So, good afternoon, sir. Uh, again, just for the record, confirm your name and what you do for a living. Mr. Speaker, Honorable Senators, my name is Mwengi Mutusa. I'm the member of parliament for Kibwezi West constituency. And I was the mover of the instant motion that is before your consideration in the National Assembly. I am also an advocate of the High Court of Kenya by profession. So great. Uh, let's go straight to the motion due to the constraints of time. Honorable Speaker, the motion is in volume one of the Assembly's bundle of documents. And allegation number one runs from pages three to 10 of volume one. So without much ado, Honorable Mutuse, let's go to allegation number one of your impeachment motion. Can you tell the Senate in very condensed summary what is the grievance you have raised against His Excellency, the Deputy President? Honorable Speaker, Honorable Senators, on our ground one allegation against the Deputy President is that he has violated various articles of the Constitution that we have listed being Article 10.2a, 10.2b, Article and C, Article 27, Article 73, 1a, Article 73.2b, 75.1c, Article 129, as well as Article 147.1 as read together with Article 131.2c and b. And basically, what we are saying is that the Deputy President in the last two years has been in various places within the Republic of Kenya and has been publicizing a, a notion that Kenya is a company that is owned by shareholders and only those who have shares in the company called Kenya, according to him, will benefit in terms of development and service delivery from the Republic. And it is our contention that Kenya is not a company. Kenya is a republic that is, uh, that is supposed to serve all Kenyans. And the particular articles of the Constitution that we have cited because of time also speak to the functions of the Deputy President being able to promote national unity and the country citizens of Kenya being able to receive services and development from the government, including appointments, without discrimination. So that is in, in short. Let's, let's, let's quickly go through uh, some of those provisions. If you could be shown the preamble to our constitution, what does the, that paragraph say? Miss, Mr. Speaker, Honorable Senators, the preamble to our constitution, and I read the third paragraph, proud of our ethnic, cultural, and religious diversity. Underline ethnic, cultural, and religious di diversity. And determined to live in peace and unity as one indivisible sovereign nation. One indivisible sovereign nation. We'll, we'll come to the evidence you have adduced to support this shortly, but are the utterances you complain about consistent with that constitutional provision? Definitely not at all. Let's go quickly to Article 10. What does it say? Article 10.1. The national values and principles of governance in this article bind all state organs, state officers, public officers, and all persons whenever any of them A, applies or interprets this constitution, B, enacts, applies or interprets any law, or C, makes or implements public policy decisions. But, uh, honorable member, someone would say these are just utterances and we surely can't remove a deputy president from office because he has a loose tongue or something like that. 
What is the problem with these utterances in the context of our history as the Republic of Kenya? Number one, the constitutional context is that uh, they bind all state officers and the deputy president is a state officer. So there are no two ways. You cannot choose the laws to obey and which not to obey. But number two, we have also had an history in our country. All of us would remember that we had clashes in Likoni in 1992 where populations were displaced. We had problems in Molo every other cycle of election, election cycle, 1992-1997. Even most recently, the country almost torn apart during the post-election violence of 2007 and 2008. There are examples within the region, Rwanda, Burundi is still struggling. As we speak today, Congo is fighting. Across the globe, Yugoslavia, there has been problems, Bosnia, all these countries. And they all began from utterances of this nature. So is it your testimony, therefore, that utterances of the type we're about to see are a threat to the very existence of Kenya as a republic? Indeed, that is my testimony. Is our lived history consistent with the submission that those are not utterances that should emanate from the deputy president of the republic? Not just the deputy president of the republic, but not from any citizen of the republic. But Honorable Motuse, have you placed any evidence? You say the deputy president has been doing this for two years. Have you placed any material to prove this allegation? Yes. We have placed videos, evidence in the form of videos that have been recorded in meetings where the deputy president has been attending, being video one, video two, video three, video four, video eight, and video 11, which contain utterances of the deputy president in that regard. Mr. Speaker, I request we play video number one from the National Assembly set of videos. Sisi lase matokea galia njini. Hii serikali ni kampuni. Na ni ya shares. Sinio? Ni ya shares. Kuna wenye kampuni, wale wako na shares mingi, kuna wale wako na chache, kuna wale awana. Sasa njini, muli university kwa hii kampuni ya William Ruto na regati kashawa. Sasa lazima, mufune, yule ambaye alipanda, atafanya nini? Simulipanda, simuliamuka mapema, muka sema mutaki kusikia mambo ya ile system na nini, muka invest, muka panda, muka palilia, muka weka mpolea, muka mwagilia maji, wakati ya kufuna diyo huu. Na itakuwa na muna hiyo. Na hiyo wakini wana nikachifu watu mimi nasema, atu wale wali panda wafune kwanza, hiko makosa? Hiko makosa? Ata hao watafuna lakini wangoje. Si wale wali panda ni wafune kwanza? Wakishavu na wafune, 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 ile tabaki kidogo, wale wakupanda, waingie, watafute huko, nini ile tapatikana, wachukue, wakuende. Siyuko na muna hiyo? Na itakuwa na muna hiyo. Diyo watu wakipiga kura waelewe hii kura tukusema nini? Hii kura hiko na maana. Nini ya muwezi piga kelele huko, mupige kelele, munasema wili ya ni bure, hawezi, munaita ya majina, alafu wakipata, akikawa, munapiga laini ya tibuko pale mbele. Ati munataka mupite wale walisema anafaa ati mkue pale mbele inaweza kana. Mimi kazi yangu pale kwa ikulu ni hiyo. Ni kupanga hiyo laini. Hapo ni kazi mimi napanga hapo. Mimi naangalia kwa laini. Nikiona we ulipanda. Na putawe nyuma. Na peleka we mbele. Because, because of the constraint of time honorable Mutuse. What did these utterances mean and what were they understood by any fair-minded Kenyan to mean? The ordinary meaning is that there are Kenyans who are supposed to benefit from the Kenyan government and there are other Kenyans who are not supposed to benefit from the Kenyan government. And His Excellency the Deputy President will make sure only those who voted for the present government 
benefit from the government. And those who did not vote for the government will not get any benefits because they are not shareholders. Uh, are those utterances consistent with the national value of human dignity in Article 10b? Not at all. Are they consistent with the value of national unity in Article 10a? Not at all. Are they consistent with social justice in Article 10b? Not at all. What about inclusiveness? Indeed, they are divisive. What about equality? Not at all. What about non-discrimination? They are very discriminative. What about protection of the marginalized? They do not protect the marginalized, they marginalize them further. We could go on and on, sir. Are those utterances consistent with any of the articles you claim in ground one have been violated? Not at all. Let's play video number two, honorable speaker. President Rigadi Gashagwa again brought up the political shareholding narrative, saying the Kenya Kwanzaa administration will prioritize Kenyans who voted for it in the distribution of government employment slots and development projects. Well, Gashagwa spoke in Nandi County, where he led other government officials in a church service and thereafter a fundraiser at Kurgung Boys High School. Ayub Abdikadir reports. Mosop constituency in Nandi County offered Gashagwa a platform to amplify his narrative about the government being a shareholding entity that apparently belongs to those who voted for it, calling on the people of Nandi County to remain patient as the state works on development projects and employment opportunities that would prioritize Kenya Kwanzaa supporters. Raisa Kopale, Nikoabo. Uyu Felix hako hapo. Raisi muna mjua. Mimi muna nijua musibama yangu. Ya kwamba watoto wakiwa wengi, kuna wale kwanza ya kuangaliwa. Si muna jua. Sasa, uyu Felix hako vale diyo mwenye kuunganisha mawaya. Mambu yedu tumepanga. His remarks, similar to the last time he sparked public debate by hinting at preferential treatment for Kenyans who voted for the government. Mambu yiko sawa. Chakula hiko jikoni, karibu kuiva, watoto ni wengi, chakula ni kidogo, hiko watoto ya nyumbani, hiko ajirani, hiko na mna hiyo na nyumi mutulie. Chakula hiki iva, sisi diwanya kupakua, na watoto tunawajua kwa sura na kwa musimamu. Hatuwezi kuwa confused, kuna mutu wajua watoto yake. The deputy president who led other Kenya Kwanza leaders for a church service and thereafter a fundraiser at Kurugung Boys High School also outlined measures... Let's play. In the interest of time, Mr. Speaker, I want to play all of them, then I'll put the questions. Let's hear video number three, I believe. Shagwa says he has no apologies to make over his shareholders' narratives, saying those who voted in the Kenya Kwanzaa government should re big from the government. Well, Gashagwa, who was speaking in Nandi County, where he led a fundraiser towards the construction of the ACK Plaza in Kapsabet Town, also dismissed claims that there are differences between himself and President William Ruto. Martin Munene has the details. Deputy President Regade Gashagua was in President William Ruto's Rift Valley backyard on Sunday, where he presided over fundraiser in aid of Kapsabet ACK Church. And here, the DP made it clear that he was not backing down on his shareholders' gospel that has left a bad taste in many people's mouths. I am unapologetic to demand and to insist that those who believed in William Ruto and supported him to a man have every right to benefit immensely from his government. I have no apology. Let's play video number four, eight, and eleven in that sequence. Sir a government is like a company. There is shareholding. Kunawale who have invested a lot of shares. Kunawale wameweka kidogo. Kunawale wamekata. Lakini wote ni wa Kenya. So diyo tukasema, kama wewe umeenda kupanda, 
mahindi ama wacha nipeane example ya ngombe kwa sababu niko kajiado wewe uko na ngombe yako ya maziwa hiyo ngombe imezaliwa ikiwa njau umechunga vizuri umepatia majani umenulia dairy meal umepatia chumvi umepeleka kwa malisho umepatia maji imezaa imeanza kukamuliwa wewe unatakiwa kwanza ukue mtu ya kwanza kukamua hiyo ngombe na kukunywa maziwa serikali a government is like a company there is shareholding kuna wale who have invested a lot of shares kuna wale wameweka kidogo kuna wale wamekataa lakini wote ni wa Kenya so ndio tukasema kama wewe umeenda kupanda mahindi ama wacha nipeane example ya ngombe kwa sababu niko kachiano wewe uko na ngombe yako ya maziwa hiyo ngombe imezaliwa ikiwa njau we can go to the next because we see an element of repetition let's go to the next video kiongozo na kemani chombo wako pale bunge wagawe pesa kwa kila mtu Kenya na hivyo ndivyo inaendelea yes video number 11 kwa watu ya kukusaidia utatafuta the good people of Homa Bay that I am going to work with your leaders, the ones you have elected, so that we can develop our country together. Competition is over. Situ memaliza mambo ya mashindano. Situ memaliza mambo ya mashindano. Si ile kazi imebaki ni sisi kuwafanyia kazi sasa. Si ni kweli? Muko tayari kufanya kazi na mimi. Munasema nifanye kazi na viongozi wenu wale mliowachagua mimi na wahakikishia nitafanya kazi na wao ndio tupange mambo ya maendeleo ya Homa Bay tupange mambo ya maendeleo ya Kenya ndio tuweze kupeleka taifa letu mbele tuondoe umaskini tupange ajira ya hawa vijana tupunguze gharama ya chakula na tupange mambo ya maendeleo ya Kenya tutengeneze nchi ambayo kila mkenya so, Motusa, you know, you could play these videos on and on. Unfortunately, time is not with us. But please confirm that you have presented before Senate utterances made by the Deputy President on this theme in Kitui. Is that correct? It, that is correct. In Nandi, is that correct? That is correct. In Kericho, is that correct? That is correct. In Kajiando, that is correct. Please confirm it is in public domain. These utterances have been made in very many other places. These were just illustrations. Indeed, I suspect it, they have been made even in the counties represented by the senator seated here. Have these been isolated aberrations or has it been a consistent campaign and mantra by the deputy president across the republic? It has been consistent and as the deputy president says, unapologetic. But you also played for us a video where the president is speaking. How does it compare with the utterances and the campaign by his deputy? The president is preaching national unity. And I believe that is a function assigned to the president under Article 131 of the Constitution to be a symbol of national unity. And the deputy president is also required to deputize the president in performance of his functions. And therefore, it will be expected that the deputy president will take cue. Instead, the deputy president is contradicting the president. We have seen these events covered by a major television station, right? Indeed. Does that television, to the best of your knowledge, have national or is it local coverage? National and, sometime, and some of them regional coverage. Should the deputy president of the republic have the wisdom to know his utterances will be conveyed to the country and the world? Indeed, yes. 
We saw him talking about children that belong to the family, and although we don't use the language these days, some illegitimate children. Who yes. was he calling children from outside the home or the illegitimate ones? Looking in totality for more his videos, he must have made those who voted for Kenya Kwanza as the legitimate children, and those who did not vote for Kenya Kwanza as the legitimate children. We have seen him saying he has no apologies to make, notwithstanding that these utterances, to quote the media who are leaving a bad taste in the mouths of many people. Is that correct or incorrect? Yes, he is very loudly clear that he has no apologies to make for calling, for referring to Kenya, for saying Kenya is a company belonging to shareholders for the benefit of the shareholders. That defiance and the stance that he has no apology to make, does it depict the deportment of a man or a woman who should be the deputy president of the Republic of Kenya? Not at all. But you are... You had his counsel say that there must be some extraordinary wrongdoing before we can impeach for mere utterances or for the things you have alleged. To the best of your knowledge, sir, how many vice presidents or deputy presidents has Kenya had since 1963? In your estimate, how many? Eleven. Eleven. Eleven or thereabout? Let, let's say a dozen, twelve, right? Yes. Do we have in our history since 1963 experience of a deputy president who traverses the country's preaching ethnic exclusion? I don't remember any. The only incident I remember, two incidences, mm. when Jaramogi differed with Kenyatta and he did the moral thing, resigned from government. I also remember an incident, I think it was Vice President Morumbi, who also differed with the then president and did the honorable thing and resigned from government. Those were the first two vice presidents, Daniel Arap Moy was at that. Do you know of any incident where Daniel Arap Moy was moving around this country as vice president, did what? committing this type of wrongdoing? No, not at all. How about Moy Kibaki? In fact, even when he was demoted, he continued working in cabinet. How about Josephat Karanja? Not at all. How about George Saitoti? Even when he was, uh, he was sacked, he continued being loyal to the government of the day. How about Musalim Devadi? In his short stint, nothing is hard about him undermining his boss. How about the country? Modi Awari? Not at all. Kalonzo Musioka? Not at all. So when we are told there is nothing extraordinary about this wrongdoing, is that consistent with the lived reality of Kenya? There is everything extraordinary. When a country of 46 tribes, someone advocates for the servicing of less than two of their, those communities, where will the 44 go? Given the politics of 41 against 1 in 2007 and the post-election violence, would this allegation be extraordinary wrongdoing? It is an extraordinary wrongdoing. In fact, the post-election violence that resulted from that particular kind of campaign was in itself extremely dangerous to our social fabric and extremely dangerous to our economy. Given the experience of the Molo and Likoni clashes in the 90s, would this be extraordinary wrongdoing coming from the second senior Mu state officer? Indeed, and also when it is remembered that he was a district officer in Molo when those clashes were happening. Given what is going on right now as we speak in Tana River, would conduct like this emanating from None other than the deputy of the president be extraordinary misconduct? I have seen in news that there are families that are displaced, people have lost property, and if that is not extraordinary, then I do not know what extraordinary means. Given, sir, and I will summarize this, what this type of campaign achieved in Rwanda, in Burundi, in Sudan, in South Sudan, in former Yugoslavia, 
in Nigeria, the Biafra War, and we could count and count until the cows go home. Can anyone be had in good conscience to say that this is not extraordinary misconduct? Indeed, that, that, this is ex, ex, very extraordinary, requiring impeachment. Please confirm, because we are pressed for time, that the evidence you're relying on on this ground applies equally to allegation number five of your motion. Just a minute to confirm. What is your complaint in allegation number five? Allegation number five, Mr. Speaker, will be at page 16 to 17 of volume two. Allegation number five, just a minute. Mr. Speaker, honorable members, our allegation number five relates to gross violation of Article 3, one of the Constitution, and Article 148.5a of the Constitution, which particularly, specifically, is in relation to the breach of the oath of office and allegiance. Does the oath of office require the deputy president to promote national unity or the shareholder politics? The oath of office demands of the deputy president to promote national unity. And what is your complaint in ground number six, sir? In ground number six, That again is on page 16 to 17, Mr. Speaker. Ground number six is about serious reasons to believe that the Deputy President has committed a crime under national law pursuant to Article 151B and 2 of the Constitution. And what is the specific complaint? The specific complaint is that uh, there are serious reasons to believe that His Excellency Rigathi Gashagwa has committed crimes under Section 13.1a and 62 of the National Cohesion and Integration Act. Can you please read for us those sections of the law? Section 13 of the National Cohesion and Integration Act provides that it is an offense. Honorable Speaker, that, that section will be in Volume 7 of the Assembly's documents. That it is, it is an offense for any person to use threatening, abusive, or insulting words or behavior where the person intends to stir up feelings of ethnic contempt, hatred, hostility, violence, or discrimination. The section also makes it an offense to use words or engage in such behavior when, having regard to all the circumstances, ethnic hatred is likely to be stirred up. Is ethnic hatred likely to be stirred up by this campaign of shareholding? Obviously. Is it likely to stir up ethnic contempt? Obviously. What does Section 62 say? Section 62 of the National Cohesion and Integration Act states that a person commits an offense when the person makes statements that are intended or are likely to stir up feelings of ethnic, ethnic contempt, hatred, hostility, violence, or discrimination. Are the utterances by the deputy president likely to trigger any of those things? Yes, indeed. As a matter of fact, Honorable Mutuse, that law you just read, National Cohesion and Integration, wasn't it the law parliament enacted to ensure we never go back to where our country was in 2007-2008 because fact, of utterances like this? It was pursuant to the post-election violence and the country resolved that we needed a law as a result. And therefore, it is a law that is supposed to ensure that we in office live to promote national unity and not the opposite. Given that history and why that law exists, sir, we repeat the question. Has the deputy president committed ordinary or extraordinary wrongdoing? He has, under Article 150 of the Constitution, in relation to this ground, 
there are serious reasons to believe that he has committed wrongs against the National Cohesion and Integration Act, uh, and if extraordinary in nature. And, 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 and if you allow me, these are not my words. Uh -huh. I have been accused of urging the National Assembly to believe me. These are not my words, they are words of the Constitution under Article 150. Thank you. I want to, Mr. Speaker, we are urging the Senate if you consider the evidence so far adduced, then that evidence applies to Ground 1, 5, and 6. So we are prosecuting them together to save on time. Let's go to allegation number seven, sir. Mr. Speaker, that allegation runs from pages 17 to 31. It was the one you were told runs from falsehoods, culminating in the embarrassing and other things. Let's see whether it is actually falsehoods, embarrassing, and the other adjectives that we were told that I would urge members to work with me by holding volume 2A, volume 2A of the assemblage documents, together with our volume 6. 6, I only mention it briefly. Please confirm, sir, at page two of volume six, who as between you and the deputy president as passions were cast, that you're referring to irrelevant material about the estate of the lady Ritu Gajegua. Between you and the deputy president, who has brought up this issue of the estate? Is it you or is it him? In the response by the deputy president, on page two of volume six, he did, he did bring out the issue of the estate of his late brother in response to the allegations that he has acquired properties worth 5.2 billion within, a period that, within the period that he has been deputy president. So we'll come back to that document much later. I'm only mentioning it now, sir, to clear the hair, whether it is you trying to weep emotions by bringing up this matter, or it is the deputy president attempting, by his own response, to hide behind the shadow of his late brother. I never mentioned any of my deceased relatives. I have them, but I never mentioned any. The deputy president is the one who mentioned his deceased he, relatives. He's actually the one who has brought this material, isn't it? Indeed. Good. Now we'll come to it. Let's go back to your allegation. Ground number seven, sir. Can you tell the Senate in summary, we are so pressed for time, what is... Mr. Speaker, honorable members, underground number seven, our allegation is that there are serious reasons to believe that His Excellency Rigathi Gashagwa has committed crimes under section 45.1, 46.47.A.3, and 48.1 of the Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Act, as well as sections 2, 3, 4, and 7 of the Proceeds of Crime and the Money Laundering Act. And in short, we, during the short period that I was doing research on this motion, I have come across properties that are registered in the name of the Deputy President, or in the name of his children, or other proxies, that run cumulatively to a value of about 5.2 billion. And there is no clear trace of where the monies to purchase those properties came from, and therefore, under the Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Act, qualify to be unexplained assets. Number two, I have also listed companies, companies that are associated with the Deputy President, 22 of them. And these companies, you look at the objects and purposes, they are all the same. And it is our theory and our evidence that these companies have been used for money laundering. Similarly, I have also listed companies that have been transacting with the office of the Deputy President, the office held by the Deputy President, His Excellency Rigathi Gashago, with tremendous respect. And they are being paid from that office, and we have laid ground for serious reasons to believe that these companies are actually conduits for corruption, and that political responsibility 
even when he's not the accounting officer, rates with the highest holder of that office. And that is the case we are making here. And we shall be showing the connection between the properties and His Excellency Rikadi Gashangwa. And in a case of unexplained assets, it is upon the person to show where they actually got the money to buy the assets. We have evidence that the assets belong to him. Let, let's begin with the company, Honorable Mutuze. You said you have attached from CR12 to your motion. Indeed, I have attached from CR12, being evidence of ownership of those companies. Directors. Would that be the form CR12 on pages 8, all the way to 32 of volume 2A? Indeed, yes. Honorable Speaker, it's volume 2A, pages 8 to 32. It actually begins, Honorable Speaker, it's me who is mistaken. It's from page 1 to 32, right? Indeed, yes. And because we are stressed for time, sir, does this document show in black and white that the majority of these companies, the directors and shareholders, are either the deputy president or his sons or his spouse? Yes, they do, and senators will have opportunity to look at the form cr Many of them are under two weeks old, so they are very recent. Let's go to the question of the purchase and, and of... Can also, you can also independently confirm from the e-citizen portal, it is only 650 shillings to do as a company such. You, you have mentioned Tree Tops Hotel and Outspan Hotel in paragraph 45A. Yes, indeed. Let's confirm whether this is false, ridiculous, or embarrassing. Did the deputy president issue a public address on the 7th of October in which he admitted acquiring these two hotels? Yes, indeed, and it is part of our evidence. So without admission from him, can he be here to say your allegations are false, ridiculous, and embarrassing. That is not expected from the son of Mau Mau. Let's go to page 33, sir, of your volume 2, eh? Yeah, Mr. Speaker, sir, we have been um, patiently waiting and restraining myself from pause, raising... Pause the time for the National Assembly, please. I've Proceed, Council. I've been constraining myself when listening to the proceedings, and Council is testifying instead of the witness testifying. Number two, he's asking leading questions in examination in chief, and council understands the rules of examination. A case in point, you're very general. A case in point? Yeah, yeah, the, the Hansons, Mr. Speaker, sir, will bear us witness, and the Senate is a custodian of the Hanson. Council, I'm very alert. Any leading questions? Before you even you take your feet, I'll be able to Objective. I'm, I'm very alive to that. Proceed, Council. Much obliged, Mr. Speaker. Let's go to page 33, sir. What is that document on volume 2A? On page 33, this is a discharge of charge between Wayne Holdings Limited and Abadea Safari Lodges Limited. Yes. Drawn by the firm of Hamilton, Harris, and Matthews. On page 34, what is given as the amount of the loan being discharged? The loan being discharged is 143,885,042 shillings. Please confirm this loan is being discharged as of 30th October 2023. Yes, the loan is being discharged as out of 30th October 2023. And the loan was to Abadea Safari Hotels Limited. Would that mean this hotel was indebted before the Deputy President acquired it? It was inevitable. To what amount? 143,885,042 shillings. Let's go to page 37.
What is that document you have annexed, sir? The document I have annexed here is the transfer instrument. Transferring, transfer to companies and limited liability partnerships. Yes. It is a, doc, it's a document ordinarily that is used to transfer interest in what? Interest in, in, in property from one party to the next. And who is acquiring the, that property according to this document? The property is at this time belonged to Abadea Safari Hotels Limited and is being transferred to Crystal Kenya Limited. Is Crystal Kenya Limited a company linked to the Deputy President? Yes, indeed, and we have annexed it's the form CR12. In which page? The form CR12 is on page 23 of our... Volume 2A. Of our Volume 2A. Who are given as the directors there? The directors are one, Keith Ikino Rigadi. Who is that? That is a son to Honorable Rigadi Gashagwa. Yes. And the second director is Kevin Gashagwa Rigadi. Yes. Also a son. Now let's go back to 37. As the deputy president in his response explained, where he got more than half a billion shillings, and to be precise, 535 million to acquire this hotel. Uh, to begin with, the consideration for this transfer was Kenya shillings 535 million, and this needs to be added to the loan of 143 million. Yes. Cumulatively. Yes. So that you get the value, because the value of, of in terms of the the, what, what, was, what was the purchase? Yes. In his response, and I have seen it, mm -hmm. the Deputy President alludes that he got a loan of 600 million, that when he became Deputy President, he used to run this company called Crystal, but when he became Deputy President, he gave it to his children to run it. And he goes further to say that uh, he got a loan of 600 million from the Credit Bank of Kenya. Has he actually placed before this Senate evidence of the disbursement of any such loan? I have seen a letter of offer for that loan, but I have not seen any evidence of disbursement nor any charge in respect of that loan. Is a letter of offer loan evidence that a loan has actually been given? A letter of offer is just that, an offer. That letter is annexed of offer says that as security for the supposed loan, there will be director's guarantees. Has he annexed those director's guarantees? I have, to the best of my recollection, I have not seen them. It says that the loan will be secured by personal guarantees. Has he also annexed those personal guarantees? I have not seen them. Has he annexed any security known in the banking world for acquiring a loan of this amount? What I have seen is what I have seen in the letter of offer is at uh, I'm looking at it is in terms of the lien and set off at yes. page 132 or 534 is that lien and set off of a fixed Please deposit. Please say which volume you're referring to on the page so no. that the Senate will work Council, with you. I'm refer the I'm senators would wish to know I'm, I'm where the letter of offer is contained. Which volume? The letter of offer, Mr. Page? Speaker. Which page? What page? It, it's in volume six. It's in volume six, at starting from page 98. Yes, walk us through that letter of offer. So the, there is a letter of offer, meaning there was an application for a loan. And this is uh, to the directors of Crystal Kenya Limited. Crystal Kenya Limited is the company that is acquiring uh, Safari, Abadea Safari Lodges. And the loan is in respect of uh, an amount of 600 million. And in the clause for lien and set off, I have seen that uh, a lien and set of or fixed deposits, this is on page 99, in respect of INO Crystal Kenya Limited for an aggregate amount of 300 million 
to be obtained. Interest accrued shall be credited to your deposit settlement account. Let, let's stick to that one for now. From elementary banking knowledge, what do we conclude from this issue of the 300 million? My understanding is that the account held at the bank at 300 million shillings in cash and that uh, that amount was going to be part of the security for the loan. So it means the deputy president or his sons had already cash in that account of 300 million shillings? Yes, which is also an asset that we are counting in accumulating the 5.2 billion. Now let's count that, sir, 300 million, 535 million, and the 143 million that had been to be paid to pave way for this transaction. Indeed, yes. In estimate, that would be like how much money? 535 plus 300. Is 8, 35. 835 plus 143, roughly a billion shillings. Roughly a billion shillings. In respect of one transaction. Just one property. Now, if the deputy president were to save all his net salary for 10 years, would he be able to have savings of a billion shillings to acquire this hotel? Not at all. For, but because... From the non... From the non, from the non source, legitimate source of income, which is his salary as deputy president, as gazetted by the SRC, roughly around 1.2 billion after taxation, an aggregate of a million shillings, it would not be possible to acquire a billion, sh a billion shillings within a period of two years. Now, these three figures, sir, whether it is the 143 million or the 300 million or the 535 million, has the deputy president in his response no, 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 no. offered any legitimate explanation of how he or his very young sons came upon this incredible fortune of money? Nowhere in the response other than the, the letter of offer that is in itself not evidence of acquiring a loan. A page 39 was shown as the parties to this transaction for Abadea's hotel? Page that nine of... Uh, of volume 2A. Uh, page 39 of volume 2A. The parties to this transaction for Crystal Kenya Limited, Kevin Gashagwa Rigadi, and Keith Ikino Rigadi. For Abadea Safari Hotels, there is Robert Gadenji yes. and Kenneth Waiboshi. Are, are those two gentlemen you mentioned first related to the Deputy President? Indeed, they are his children. As a matter of fact, Honorable Mutusen will do it in the closing statement. Does our Public Officer Ethics Act or the Leadership and Integrity Act faced with facts like this permit the Deputy President to hide behind his sons? Not at all. Is he allowed to hide behind any of his relatives? Not at all. What about his spouse? Not at all. So even if the Senate were to accept for argument's sake that this company is run by the sons and whatnot, would that based on the, our Public Officer Ethics Act or the other act, which is the leadership, and would that be a valid answer to this unexplained wealth? Section 35 of the Leadership and Integrity Act. Please say the volume you're reading. I'm reading from volume seven in our band of documents at page 34, acting through others. A state officer contravenes the court if the officer A causes anything to be done through another person that would constitute a contravention of the court if done by the state officer or allows or directs a person under their supervision or control to do anything that is in contravention of the court. Mr. Speaker, acting through others is what previously I have called it was in me. But let's jump to page 79 of volume 2A.
Yes, we are here. Again, this is documentation for that same property the deputy president admits he acquired, right? Yes, through Abadea, just for contextualization, Abadea owned two hotels. Yes. There is Street Ops Hotel. Yes. And there is... There is which one? Outspan. Yes. Outspan is the one that we have demonstrated how it was purchased. Treetops mm -hmm. is a property developed by the Kenya Wildlife Service. But it was under the same management of Abadea, so they were acquired together. So let, let's pause at it is owned by the Kenya Wildlife Service. Yes. Is the Kenya Wildlife Service a public or a private entity? A public entity funded by the taxpayers. Under our Chapter 6 laws, that is the Public Office Ethics Act, the Leadership and the Integrity Act, if you want, you can even draw the Public Procurement and Disposal Act, whichever law. Is it consistent with all those laws for the Deputy President of the Republic to acquire without competitive bidding an interest in a resource owned by the Kenya Wildlife Service? It is not. And in fact, the Deputy President is on record in these proceedings as having said that he advised his, his, his family not to transact with government. But we are going to demonstrate that he actually transacted with KWS. And KWS is a public entity. And KWS is a public entity. If this hotel were to be leased or sold, or whatever the language, would there be a requirement for open, competitive, and transparent bidding? Section 45, which we said we have reasonable grounds to believe that the pres Deputy President has breached of the Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Act. And I'm reading uh, volume seven at page 23, states as follows. Protection of public property and revenue. A person is guilty of an offense if the person fraudulently or otherwise unlawfully, A, acquires public property or public service or benefit, B, mortgages, charges, or disposes of any public property, C, damages public property, including causing a computer or another electronic machinery to perform any function that directly or indirectly results in a loss or adversely affects any public revenue or service or fails to pay any taxes or any fees, levies, charges payable to any public body or effects or obtains an exemption, remission, reduction, or abatement from payment of any such taxes, levies, and fees. Section 46, about abuse of office. A person who uses his office to improperly confer a benefit on himself or anyone else is guilty of an offense. Now, let's go to page 81 of volume 2, A, sir. It's still about three tops hotel. Page 81 of yes. volume 2A. I'm there. Can you read for us the last sentence of the second paragraph? This is a letter. This is a letter from uh, the Kenya Wildlife Service. Yes. To Mr. Amos Kisilo of Kisilo and Wandati Company Advocates. It's a letter dated when? The letter is dated uh, at the top left. What is the date? 5th of June, 2023. Was His Excellency the Honorable Rigadi Gashagwa, the Deputy President of Kenya, on that date? Yes. It is addressed to who? 